Let me find it. There it is. Um, am I sharing? Yes. Yep. I can't tell. What is it showing? It shows uh, river is readings at the top, and it says May 17th, 2020. Okay, that's it. Um, yeah, so I just thought uh, I would share this, because I was thinking about how I, you know, talking about thriving or surviving the pandemic. And for me, I've had a very bumpy ride, actually, um, at different times. But I was thinking about early on, this was May 17th, and I thought I'd just read this short text and then show some images. Um, I live a short walk from the Hackney Marshes in the tiny Wick Woodland, and one of the beautiful, unpredicted results of being here under lockdown is that I've fallen in love with this vast green space near my house. I've always loved and appreciated it, but now I'm in love with it. It's a real romance. Over the past eight weeks, I've been getting to know its microenvironments more intimately, the tiny details and hidden paths, the songs and haunts of specific birds, the smell of the trees and flowers and even weather and the beauty that lies in the daily change and the de decay taking place all around me as I walk and then run through it. And so this, this evolved along with my running practice, um, which I didn't plan to happen because of the pandemic, but was just starting at the beginning of the pandemic. And it, it, these are what I did one day. I took an old Polaroid out. Um, I had eight shots and I just, I just had um, this thought in mind that I'm going to go on a walk on this day, uh, my daily exercise, and, um, and just try to think about a sequence of images, a story I could tell, you know, about this woodland. And this woodland was bright green with this, I can't remember what they call it, but it's cow, cow something, these tall green bushes with these white flowers all over the tops of them that you could walk through that were up to your chest. You know, and it was just this amazing, beautiful, bright place. And then this Polaroid had old expired film and um, had light leaks. And I, you know, trying to clean it, I then ended up with a blank image. And it was a bit of a debacle. But I knew I just had this, the limitations of these eight images. And so I just thought I'd show a couple up close so you can see how, you know, they're kind of fuzzy. They've got crinkles around the edges and the light leak, but there was something so wonderful about this experience because what came out of the images as well weren't at all what I thought would show, you know, and it's almost a dark, like another, a dark warm side of the woodland, you know, it was like it was showing itself to me in a different way through these images. And it was just, um, I guess I just wanted to share it because it's an example of like these small moments and the small things that helped me to get through, uh, especially early on in the pandemic. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing. And, and for me, one of the things I've realized is um, I had to check my expectations because I had so many expectations of myself and what I should be doing and could be doing big projects or, you know, things that I, I felt like I should bring forward. And there was so little, you know, that was in our control in a way um, that, that it was almost like I had to embrace the things I wanted to push away, like the limitations, like the, you know, this limit of going out once a day or, you know, this running path I had was this tiny, <laughs> tiny woodland and I do kind of triangles around it and cut through and, but, but these, these limitations allowed me to, find a different way of being present um, with myself and sort of daily. And that's not to say that I, it wasn't hard because there were a lot of hard days for me. I had to cancel trips back to America. So I haven't been home in over two years now. And I don't know, you know, when I'll be able to go home and, and I have a mom with cancer. And so it's this, you know, she's okay right now and everything, but it's, it's an, it's, there's a sense of urgency of needing to go back home. Um, but so finding ways to, yeah, just to, to, to balance all of that, I think was really important to me. And, and recognizing that situations change, circumstances change, my response changes. Um, we're in a second lockdown now, and it's only a month long lockdown. And the restrictions are much, um, they're, they're less and they're also enforced less. So people are not adhering to them as, <clears throat> as tightly as, as they did in the first long round of lockdown, but I am finding this lockdown so difficult. You can hear fireworks, sorry if you can hear that, somebody's shooting fireworks. Um, but I'm finding it really um, 
somehow it's my response to it has shifted. And I felt like earlier in the year, there was this sense of we're all in it together. You know, let's get through this. Um, let's support our, our NHS or our health workers or frontline workers. And, and that now is a bit decayed. And now there's this, you know, the world feels more divisive. Everyone feels a little bit more isolated. And, and so I'm finding that I'm really struggling much more now than I was earlier in the year. And I'm, and I guess that's just all to say that, you know, it's good to have moments like this to remember, you know, to remind ourselves how I could react or did react or other ways of finding uh, a way to be present in the world or with myself or with the, some of the positive, um, positive sort of details, you know, of our, of our lives now, because I, I think maybe, maybe some of it now is we know it's going to be an extended period. And so we're, we're trying to run the marathon now. And so it's trying to tap into those reserves isn't necessarily straightforward if you, if you're not a marathon runner. Um, so I'm not trying to be, I, hopefully this doesn't sound down. It's just sort of this realistic kind of grappling, I guess, with, with all of this. Um, and one of the things I do want to say about the, I guess one of the, the, the sort of positive responses that I've had is trying to find those little comforts like, um, my husband and I started making oatmeal earlier in the summer. I've never been an oatmeal eater, but we would have oatmeal for breakfast because he's working at home in our bedroom. I'm in the bedroom right now. I'm working in our main living room area. We have the two rooms, that's it. Kitchen is a part of that. And we don't have a garden. We're on the second floor. So it's, this is a very confined space. But finding these little routines, you know, there's oatmeal together or, um, yeah, or the daily walk or... I don't know, there's a flock of pigeons that flies by the window and I love stopping to watch them. And, and those are the things that are kind of getting me through. And there's some such simple things, um, but they really become the world in a way, you know, um, that sounds so cheesy as I say, it, but, but it's, it's true. Like that's, so that's, I guess that those are just my thoughts is that trying to, um, you know, recognize that our limitations aren't necessarily bad and, um, but also that this isn't easy and we shouldn't expect that we should be behaving normally or responding normally um, or always upbeat or always able to manage it. And that's okay. Um, yeah. And, and just know that this, this ongoing process of, of finding a way forward. Yeah. That's all I have to say right now. So. I want to make a remark and uh, maybe even turn it into a question, but I want to think about the, that beautiful piece of writing you shared and those incredible images. And what I was thinking as you were doing that is thinking about the sensitivity level that it takes for someone like you to perceive that, to explore it, to get what you're getting out of it, you know, to capture it, to reflect on it. Contrast that with the people who just, hacked us and we're saying all the rude and profane things and you know how do how do how do introverts uh, empaths uh, sensitive artists how do we live in a world like this you know what what do we do how do we respond how do we and and again given the current circumstances and not just the pandemic and the responses to the pandemic and those who have felt like it was their, you know, social, political um, mandate to ignore even the most basic, careful practices. Um, and then, of course, the election and the political environment and all, all that's going on. You know, how, how does one maintain our sense of who we are and protect that in a way and yet not die to it or lessen it or mute it? so that we can continue to create and survive and thrive in a way that is worth living. It doesn't go that other direction. Anyway, if anybody wants to respond to that, fine. If not, then that can just be my thought and y'all can continue on. Hey, Michael, I, I'd like to respond to it. I think it's ironic. I think we need to go back to session one, how to uh, have compassion for assholes. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So rewind the tape and go over <laughs> what we talked about this morning is what I'm doing right now. Yeah, um, right. Because, um, yeah, I don't know their story, uh, don't need to. Um, and I just need to um, focus on, uh, 
on self-care, on, uh, on the things that we're talking about. Um, that's what I need to do to cope um, and just to um, not be Pollyanna. Um, you know, I kind of share what uh, Lynn maybe started off um, saying was I'm, I'm not so certain. I'm not, not completely optimistic about mankind. <laughs> <laughs> but I do enjoy a lot of people like everyone on this zoom right right now <laughs> um, so um yes and uh you know it's these things that um nurture us for me on these walks where I live I have been graced with a bald eagle that is flying over the bayou that I live on and sometimes on my walk, I am privileged to see this maj majestic creature fly over. And um, even in a tree one day, caught him eating a fish in a tree. It's magnificent. I wouldn't have noticed these things otherwise. One day, I got a double whammy, a, a little baby dolphin with the mother. And it was showing, him how, showing the baby how to school fish going round and round in our bayou. I walk over the bridge and the eagle was in his tree um, overlooking the scene. And it began to rain and I stood there in the rain and just enjoyed it and watched it. So that's what I choose to think and um, think about. <laughs> well, I that's think all, that's thanks good. guys. It's pretty good. And also you started with humor. And I think humor is it's not the answer, it's an answer. Humor rather than retreating into anger or resentment, because we're always going to have that. We're, we're going to have people that do th things that upset us and displease us. And it's just the nature of the beast. But humor is a way out. So I was thinking when they were doing that, uh, the uh, Groucho Marx line, I've never belonged to a club that would have me as a member. I was thinking I never belonged to a species that would have me as a member, so I turned it on myself a little bit. But you know, it's just a way of laughing at things and uh, going on, moving on. You know, one of the things that uh, Ladonna mentioned in in the first session was not taking things personally. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like I didn't take anything that was done personally, and I I, I didn't catch everything that was being said, and all you know, but. Um, that has nothing to do with us. I mean, it has absolutely nothing to do with any of us, even if it was personal or even if it had something to do with us, it, it doesn't. And, but I mentioned in that first session or maybe the second session, I think it was the first one, how I had a reaction to something that happened in basketball this week that I did take personally. And the thing that happened to basketball was no more personal, has no, was no really no more about me than, than what just happened here. But it's interesting the two different responses because in this one I had no didn't take it personally at all, and that one I did, and it's just uh, all or everything's an opportunity to learn and grow. But um, anyway, anybody else want to? I mean, I wanted to go back to you know what a lot of people are talking about is is um, you know we've lost all these human connections, of course, and so I think it is you know obviously it's an awesome opportunity to find other connections, whether it's with ourselves or definitely with nature. Um, you know, my husband and I have gone on a lot of hikes and uh, a lot of canoe trips and camping trips in this time. I mean, and we've always done that, but it's been like, well, we got nothing else to do. So this is, this is what we're doing. Um, unfortunately, we're not on, you know, a strict enough lockdown, you know, we can still do those things, except for, for a while, all the trails closed. And then that's when we were like, okay, we'll switch to canoeing. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think it's, you know, we talk about kind of like these opportunities to find appreciation and things and, and, but at the same time, I think that there's pressure, you know, people are like, oh, well, if you don't come out of the pandemic with the ability to crochet a blanket, you've failed life, you know? <laughs> and so I think it's important to recognize the opportunities, but also like cut yourself a break. And those opportunities might be like appreciating a bald eagle, you know, and like take that and appreciate that for what that is rather than, you know, oh, I don't know how to tango now. That'd be hard to do. But anyways, I don't know. <laughs> Oops. One of the things that I kept thinking was going back to that, be kind to yourself. And I mean, so it's so obvious, but it's so important and it's easy to forget, I think, during this time. 
is just to be kind to ourselves. Related to that, you know, I would say, and we sort of ran out of time in the first session, I was going to mention this, but if compassion is an, an act of the imagination and, and caring for someone else, we need to use that same thing for ourselves. And if we think about, often we're the most critical of ourselves. We're the most hard on ourselves. If, if I'm in a situation where I've, you know, not lived up to my own expectations or, or failed in a way, if I will respond to myself in the same way I would one of my children or a dear friend who, who is in the exact same situation, I would respond with such love and care and compassion and understanding, you know, you're a great person. You, that what you did or that small mistake is nothing, you know, or you, 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 your expectation was too high anyway. I mean, if we'll think about how would we respond to the people we love and care for the most and then respond to ourselves in that same way, I think we're um, in, a, in a good way. Lynn, why don't you introduce your friend? This is Brownie, American Foxhound. Well, American Squirrel Hound, since there are too many foxes around here, but she's just a delight. She's so super nice, nice little girl. Precious. Mm. And, uh, I had to, we quarantined with my youngest daughter, uh, Gracie, who Michael knows. She got a job with the uh, Atlanta Shakespeare Company. She's an actress, but they put everything on hold for a year. So she's having to wait and do things, do small jobs. And uh, it's tough for a younger person. Uh, it's tough for anyone, but for a younger person starting out in life like that, it's very, very difficult. So we've learned how to make vegetarian lasagna together and things like that. Yeah, my stepdaughter is um, Sixteen years old, and through all of this, I'm like, what is? I think that's the hardest age for me. I feel like that's the hardest age to go through a pandemic because I mean, I remember being a teenager, and like my friends were everything. It's all I ever wanted to do was be with my friends, and I had great parents, but I didn't care to be around them. I only wanted to be around my friends, you know, like it's 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 your first feeling of of being independent and you start to form your identity through those social interactions and so to be a teenager right now and to be totally cut off from that and 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 my stepdaughter is more cut off than any of her friends i mean they're all allowed to hang out with one another a lot of most of them go to school and she is just you know schooling totally at home hardly allowed to see anyone at all she she started dating her girlfriend during the pandemic and yet they're only allowed to be outside 15 feet away with masks on. So they've been, they've been going out for like, I don't know how many months now and they've never even friggin' held hands. And so I think about that a lot. Like I, I, that I'm fortunate to not be at that age, to have that desperate need to be around so many, you know, friends and new love connections and, and all of that, but also, you know, so much empathy for her not being able to have any of those things right now and it sucks because there's there's no replacing that you know like you're a parent you'll never be a, a teenage friend and so if anyone has any suggestions <laughs> hit me because i don't uh... <laughs> all i do is say i'm sorry a lot <laughs> i'm sorry pan this pandemic sucks <laughs> Well, what, if it, I don't know if it's any consolation, but you know, some of us miss those events anyway, not due to a pandemic. I missed my prom because I got in a car accident. So, you know, it, these are just things that happen. And my daughter's going to be graduating high school this year. And it's hard to know if they'll have a graduation ceremony. I hope that they come up with a great idea instead of, you know, a big massive gathering. Um, I love the drive through things. Those sound great. I love the drive through eyesore. Oh my gosh, love that. <laughs> Always love the eyesore. Um, but I, um, and I wanted to also mention just in general in school, surviving school during a pandemic. And my daughter isn't really affected. She's been a virtual student for quite a few years now. It's really not affecting her that much. Um, but it affects me because I'm a teacher and I didn't go into teaching to teach to this camera. Um, 
I, had to, I did a study session last week with my lab students and I walked into the classroom and some of them were there and I was writing on the board and I kind of got, you know, a little choked up about it because I was like, I miss this a lot. And I'm struggling with, the, with remote learning. My students are struggling with remote learning. You said it, don't put so much pressure on yourself. Um, and I tell my students that a lot. I say, look how many times I have screwed up already. Um, you know, I'm trying to pull this off, you know, seamlessly doing a virtual type of learning. You can see that I'm, all, you know, the professional that I am, I am not even having an easy time at it. I can't even imagine what you guys are, are going through right now um, trying to deal with this. And, you know, for me, it's, it is about the compassion. Um, going through Hurricane Michael, it's very similar because we came back to school like three weeks after the hurricane. And like, I remember when they told us we had to come back to work, it was like we had a meeting on Halloween and, and then they were like, we, we're gonna open back up on November the 5th, y'all re be ready. And I'm like, I don't even have walls in my house. I don't know how I can even come back to work right now. And then they're like, and we're gonna extend the schedule and we're gonna remove the holidays and, and but guess what? We did it and, because I was so worried about me and then when I came back I, when I when I walked into that classroom that first day that we came back man it was good to see those students and it reminded me that they're also struggling big time and so I, I just I just decided right then and there that I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna break rules I'm not gonna bend over backwards for my students but I am gonna give them every opportunity to finish their course and I, 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 that's just how I feel about it. If they do the work, then that's really the most that I can ask of them. And that's what I've been doing really for the past couple of years. It was last year wasn't too bad, but then once the pandemic hit, once again, you're just like, oh my gosh, now what? Because some of these students cannot come to campus because they do have high risk individuals in their homes. They might miss a class. Uh, so I'm, I'm recording my Zooms. I mean, this has, taken my job to just a whole new level. I work all the time because it's so much more work to do this virtually. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of share my struggle with you guys about surviving teaching during a pandemic. It has been brutal. I have been harassing my students that ghost on me and I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> it's so much more difficult. everything is more difficult and more of a challenge and just sharing that just you know hearing heather talking about her daughter and um you know and the challenges and then you know you and teaching and jill and, and living and working and you know all just but just to share it and share that common experience that we have and to feel for one another but also to connect to each other about that. We're all going through the same thing and it may be in slightly different ways and we have different challenges, but we all have challenges and we can connect through those, you know, Rumi said the wound is the place where the light enters us, you know, and, and these wounds, these challenges, these difficulties, these vulnerabilities, as Brene Brown would say, is where light really comes in. And that's also where we get to join each other and connect to each other and feel for one another and, you know, our own, each of our own woundedness. And not all of us have a cute little dog to hug. Three. Three. <laughs> Lakeland Terrier, American Foxhound, and a Dover boy. Wow. Part Doberman and Japanese Chin Chin. So. Nice. And my daughter's dog is uh, Havanese. She's got him in Atlanta right now. She's visiting up there. I just had another thought, and I don't remember who mentioned it. Um, someone mentioned that may have been you. I don't know, I, I, maybe it was you, Vanessa. You said that you know maybe you're going about your day and you see someone hurting or you see something oh, i was malia i think you see something that might make you you're like oh i don't know if i want to deal with that <laughs> right um kind of back to the to education i feel that way sometimes because 
I'm like, okay, I see that these students need me to reach out to them. But I know the minute, I know that when I do, that's going to put a lot more work on my plate because now I have to help them make things up. I have to communicate with them, help them understand what they need to do to get this done. I'm probably going to have to meet with them. You know, this is going to go above and beyond the 32 hours that I have to be on campus or whatever. Um, but then I, but I do it anyway. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But I guess even if it only works out a couple, you know, a few times out of those, you know, those many attempts for me reaching out, it's worth it. Because many of them do reach back and, and they're like, oh, thank you so much for even caring. It makes me think of one of my favorite definitions of love is to extend ourselves on the behalf of another. You know, and is it is a going beyond. And it is a contorting and extending a giving that costs us. It costs your time. It costs your energy, it could, you know, but, but that is a true act of loving kindness and um, the, you know, and whether they respond or not, whether you get a, 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 any kind of gratitude or even recognition or not, the act is what matters. You sh extending yourself and loving someone, um, is is that's all that matters really i just like to say uh, yeah i i uh i feel like that's what that's what gives my life meaning you know right. that's what what makes life meaningful is being there um for each other being connected helping when when i can um when you're willing to leave your castle yes <laughs> I just location. Just but, uh, but yeah. I was just gonna say out of curiosity, how many different backgrounds do you have? This, this is my creativity. I've been loving why uh, all the people who are the true artists, and I love art, and um. I feel healed by it, moved by it, and I have loved everybody sharing that has that ability. And um, since I don't, this is my creativity. It is awesome. <laughs> my background. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've been one of the highlights of today. Thank you for them. So uh, why don't we wrap up here? We have about uh, eight minutes until the next session. I think I have it set up where you will, uh, have to be entered, you know, through the, the uh, meeting, the green room, what do they call it? The waiting, waiting room. room, the waiting room. Um, which sounds so, you know, doctory and hospital, they could have come up with a better name. The green room would have been better. But anyway, thank you all so much for what you shared. Thanks for being so flexible and dealing with what we had to deal with and keep going. And I, I feel mm -hmm. like this turned into a fantastic session and maybe even in some ways because of what the uh, aforementioned assholes did. So uh, thank you, thank you all. See you in a couple of minutes, yeah.